Atlas Pandemica, Maps to a Kinder World, is a project by the Stove Network designed to encourage pioneering approaches in charting the changes that have happened since the outbreak of COVID-19 locally and tries to navigate the way forward into a more hopeful and shared future. In this series, Stove orchestrator Matt Baker speaks with the artists, writers and researchers involved in the project, offering an insight into the process and discoveries each have made. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Atlas Pandemica number nine. I'm Matt Baker and along with artist Robbie Coleman, I'm one of the curators of the project. Atlas Pandemica Maps to a Kinder World is a compendium of 10 projects led by creative people, each investigating a different theme highlighted by life during the COVID pandemic. Projects work directly with people in Dumfries and Galloway, focusing on the impacts and the learning from the community's experience of the evolving pandemic. Atlas Pandemica was conceived and is managed by community-led arts organization, The Stove Network. It explores local responses to the pandemic and how these might shape new approaches to our shared future. The project is supported by Scottish Government's Supporting Communities Fund. And you can find more information about everything to do with the project at atlaspandemica.org. In this series, I'll be talking to each of the artists leading one of the Atlas Explorations. And today, I'm totally delighted to be joined by Katie Anderson. Katie is a public artist based in Annan in Dumfries and Galloway and has spent most of her learning and development as an artist working with other creative folk in and around Dumfries and the wider region. Her creative practice is a melting pot of personal studio work and collective explorations of place and space facilitating and supporting experiments and ideas and introducing creative thinking into everyday public spaces. Hello and welcome, Katie. How Hi. Are you? <laughs> Thanks for that, Matt. No worries. You doing okay? Yeah. Good. Let's do it. So, but before we start, it's important that we have to say that Katie's representing a group of artists who all work together on the Atlas Pandemica project. Um, she took the lead role and worked as a curator supporting the development of new work by a collective of artists, each a member of the Stove Network, and also driving the core vision of the project as an opportunity to re-examine our changed relationship with public space as a result of the pandemic. So let's go back to the very beginnings of the pandemic and in some sense your project with the artists um, began before Atlas was even thought about. Can you can you talk us through some of those beginnings? So I think elsewhere elsewhere really began um, during the stove's uh, homegrown project, which we kicked off at the beginning of the first lockdown, uh, kind of March to May 2020. Um, and we really were just looking about how to keep conversations going between stove members and creative folk in our wider community um, to respond really initially to to the pandemic and to kind of allow creative conversations to keep rolling whilst we were all stuck at home. Um, and there's a, a number of different artists all really engaged with that project. And we started to develop, I guess, quite longer kind of conversations or ambitions and what they would really like to test out. A lot of artists were thinking about different ways of making their, making their work um, as a result of being stuck at home or thinking differently about how they could introduce their work to different kinds of publics or audiences. Um, and when the opportunity to think about new projects um, as part of Atlas Pandemica came up, then I thought it'd actually be really great to kind of further develop some of those strands that we'd been having conversations with all these different artists into something a little bit more collectively visioned as it were. Can, can you just say a bit more about what, what homegrown was because there were like creative challenges and little commissions and yeah how did how did all that actually yeah and it, it's weird because this feels like a million and five years ago although it was actually only just over a year it was, it was a year ago um but that sudden like crash into everyone's digital working and a lot of flailing I think generally by everyone to be like we must keep talking to each other and and doing something because because there wasn't really a lot we, we didn't hadn't really set up all those structures for feeling like we could get on with things at all. So there was this weird void. And so the stove um, looked at a series of, as you say, like different creative activities that people could take part in. And some of them were pretty, pretty open. And some of them were, I guess, more focused on 
things you could make with stuff lying around at home. So we had a variation of people responding to them from kind of families and kids through to artists that had suddenly found that all of their work had stopped. Um, and without anything else to kind of drive or focus on, found that regular like repetition of um, being sent something new every week and having to just respond to that as a almost, almost I guess like you do at art school or something was just something that gave them a rhythm to their everyday at a time when there wasn't any rhythm and kind of gave them a little bit of reassurance um, and allowed them to feel that they weren't just talking to themselves. There was another group of folk that they were also talking to. So. Does that did that answer the question at all? Yeah, because I mean, because uh, I'm thinking with Atlas Pandemica, it, it's been it's been about connecting with communities, and and I mean, I think that that that's what I really remember from Homegrown was that um, that sense that the the creative community was a community that had been incredibly affected by the pandemic. A lot, but a lot of people were, we. We, we work with a, a freelance and literally lost all of their income and work overnight. Like a, I mean, people have work stacked up year, sometimes years in advance and it all stopped. And, and there was that sense of um, uh, suddenly becoming incredibly isolated because our work, work world and our network was, is, is the way that we, we interact with each other and understand our place in the world. and. Yeah, that's that's what I understood homegrown as as a way of way of keeping that community together as well. Is that? Yeah, completely. Because I think yeah. when we first maybe started to initiate a lot of those projects, we're going, oh, people are going to have to entertain each other, or people are going to have to, and actually, that it wasn't really what what that drew out. What it really drew out that felt really important was for creative people, uh, predominantly locally, but also some from kind of further afield who were really interested in the practices and the work of of the stove and kind of socially engaged type work and saying, right, how do we, how do we keep that focus or how do we actually grow that focus in my art practice if it wasn't previously very particularly public facing? Um, and folk going, actually, this has been an opportunity for us to, to stop and really think about our studio practice and think about how we might lift that out a little bit or speak a little bit further. Um, and that homegrown really started to, I guess, introduce that that conversation to a lot of those people um, in a way that was unexpected and not really planned, but felt to me really valuable and quite something that was really worth hanging on to as we sort of started, as the first set of restrictions sort of relaxed a little bit. I've, I've really noticed that, that there's a number of, a number of artists that are sort of saying that they want to work in a different way and they want their, want to, integrate their work into communities so they want to make make a difference with what they do or they, you know I think the, I think the pandemic's really really caught, caused a lot of reflection for people I think mm -hmm. that, you know I mean was that um was that part of the idea of people working together for Atlas Pandemica then? Yeah I think so a lot of when I spoke to each of the individual artists um that was one of the things that people kind of said was most important about the project was either that it gave them an, a, a new way of connecting them with other creative folk and a, a new way of feeling like they could be sharing their work and sharing their ideas and having a little bit of an you know that became a discursive space for all we actually never all met up together in person mm -hmm. um and also then that it, it became that opportunity for people to test ideas or ways of working that they maybe previously had and I think everybody everybody's work or otherwise their outside of their creative work their regular like day day work had a public related part to it. So they all had some way of relating with people, whether that was through creative workshop or schools or kind of youth engagement, but hadn't really had the opportunity to do certain things with the way they were making work. And this became a, a space for them to go, actually, let's just try that now because whilst everything's so up in the air, now must be the time for us to try something a little bit more experimental or those ideas you always kind of wanted to do, but didn't really know how to. Let's, let's think about actually, let's just, let's figure out how the how bit. Um, and then see see how that kind of reflects it. It kind of became about, I guess, looking at the things that those artists all really wanted to grow or test as part of their kind of developing practice as a result of COVID, testing it and then kind of coming back together um, digitally and and exploring what what kind of impact or what what useful or otherwise we kind of learn from that, both individually and collectively. So that individual collective thing was kind of. Um, had, had had nice balances in in the way that it sort of grew and wove through the project. 
Isn't it interesting with, you know, I mean, when you think about it in connection with some of the other, other projects, like say, um, Karen Campbell's project working with the council, there was that, there was that sense of freedom and license that council workers got of like not having to follow normal processes and actually just being able to think something up and do it. But you don't, you don't normally think of creative people as being people who need, need an excuse for license. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting that. So you're, 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 you're thinking that the pandemic really freed, freed some people up in terms of the way that they were working. Yeah. I think, to be honest, a lot of that likely was the sudden availability of time. Right. Um, and that total, the, a lot of people referred to that, like that change in pace that we all experienced last year was pretty dramatic. And and even people who I guess are quite driven in their practice and, and were creating a lot as part of their work, weren't finding that space for those like, Oh, I'd really like to try film projection. I've never really, you know, and didn't didn't know about the skills necessary to take their work from a digital sphere to a projected in a space sphere or that kind of installation practice or the big pay stops. There was there was a, like, how can we make the scale of this much bigger? That that eking over into that, like, how how do we make those those next kind of technical steps in our work I guess just because you're kind of relentlessly charging through whatever you're doing that opportunity to pause and go how do we get to there hadn't really happened for a while for people so this in some ways weird uh positive moment of that was that that change in pace allowed everyone to kind of maybe look at how we made that that jump for those bits of work to become something a little bit different from the kind of work they'd normally be making potentially so I mean in terms of your your project that that getting there um, became elsewhere. I mean, the project was called Elsewhere. What, what can you say a bit more about the thinking behind the behind the title? Yeah, and I guess so. Elsewhere started off um, in lots of different ways. I mean, we kind of ruminated on this this theory or theme of Elsewhere for a while and taking taking somewhere that's familiar and turning it into something new or something different or changing the way that we understand a place. How could somewhere go from being kind of familiar every day to being Elsewhere or somewhere we thought we knew and, and now became different? Um, so I guess that was a lot of the, the premise in Elsewhere was about that locating thing, taking this particular space. And in this case, really, De Vries Town Centre was where we were thinking about um, although we didn't, we weren't particularly sure whereabouts in the town centre to start with. Um, I'm, I'm waffling a little bit because I'm trying to read notes and think at the same time that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you were sounding great. Oh, I just ran out of steam. So elsewhere as, as a, um, the, the town centre being somewhere that used to be familiar and suddenly through 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 lockdown basically became, became sort of an alien place that we weren't weren't visiting anymore and be, became an elsewhere yeah totally and, and I guess when we first um we, we at the stove we'd be kind of imagining this idea of an elsewhere almost pre-pandemic but once the pandemic happened and that incredible change that everyone experienced in their town centers and kind of central areas where it, things completely changed overnight and for months that weird sort of vacuum of public space that when when the first one everyone emptied out and then also as people started to kind of like who appeared first who was using the space differently and how spaces got kind of reoccupied um mm. and like in Dumfries from the kids playing outside in the square um they were probably the first folk back there and then as as things gradually started to open up again public space became the one place you could meet someone or or even actually just go and be with other people in the same space you know like go and sit on a bench because other people were also sitting on benches and that was about as much like human connection as some people could get or wanted so the, the high street has gone through this incredible kind of like change in I guess like role for everybody who who used it previously, who didn't use it before, and is now kind of relearning that space. And, and so suddenly we went, actually, what's really interesting about that, um, that space is that there's a lot of opportunities for how we could be um, kind of repopulating that space or moving back into it. And that, that the creative practice that people had been developing through this kind of homegrown conversation actually could provide something really valuable in helping us 
flip that space around a little bit and not just be going it's somewhere for marketing out into two meter square boxes so everyone can line up for the shops or um, can you know safely maneuver around each other without come it, it, it we had to kind of allow other things to happen in that space too within all the kind of guidance so yeah it, it feels like a lot of changes have happened and then Christmas happened and it all shut again and this we had experienced this kind of weird winter of absence and we're back almost almost cyclical again you know it's because so I'm kind of interested in this like repeated changing of those spaces and how we can keep a conversation about what's most important about those spaces um because it's something we've been talking about for years anyways is is really is like what what's the role of these spaces how can they be most kind of activated by the communities that that live in you in them and use them as opposed to just being kind of marketed out by somebody else as this is the sole purpose of this space right now so yeah, because I mean, for people who don't know, don't know Dumfries Town Centre well, it's a, it's a, it's a place that doesn't it doesn't have anybody really living in it. So I mean, almost the best way to imagine it is it's almost like a sort of giant outdoor shopping mall that that only only comes to life when there are people working and shopping and doing stuff in in the mall, and then when so obviously during lockdown there was no real reason for anybody to be there I mean, other than their sort of like daily walk but most people in Dumfries seem to be walking up and down the river rather than walking up the town centre so it really did become an incredibly um, abandoned space during that first lockdown didn't it mm -hmm. yeah I mean so the way that way that people were using I mean it's interesting you uh, were talking about people it becoming a social space after that uh after the first lockdown when people couldn't meet in houses or you know people can you describe some of those things that were going on in don't you know because that that was that was an interesting time of like people coming back to the town center and suddenly sort of like seeing it seeing it differently again yeah and it was it was kind of funny because i guess in a lot of ways a lot of the shops weren't reopening and cafes and other things hadn't reopened, but people were still coming into town and it's kind of like, well, what, what are they doing? Um, or I guess even, even the past month when there's been almost nothing open, you could get like a, a takeaway coffee from, from Greg's. That was kind of your option for the high street, but still people have been kind of coming and, and actually just sitting or thinking about all those kind of public benches and, and that as a sort of suddenly a, a sort of, I don't know, even know how to describe that, but as, as a populatable space or as a space that people could come and linger without purpose is, is kind of interesting. Or And that really only happens for quite a small bit in the middle of the day. Mm. Um, before people it, go, so it's kind of like people are coming in to see, to see if there's anything going on or not and like how much people were paying attention to shop window posters or stuff. You know, like people were really, I guess, it, acknowledging or noticing their town center spaces in a wee bit of a different way. Mm. What I quite liked the first time round is as, as we got to that phase, everybody started to paint everything or clean everything or tidy. And you're like, it was, there was quite an effort by a lot, of, a lot of the people with businesses to kind of, you know, not just in Dumfries even, but just, just to make that bit of a difference. And suddenly everyone's going, oh yeah, it looks, if you've not been somewhere for a while, it looks really grubby. And then everyone was taking the care and like when the council couldn't, Get their workers in to plant all the flower boxes out they put out like a call for people to plant flowers for the council and the council's boxes and they got totally inundated with folk being like yeah we'll plant your flower boxes and, and i thought that was that was a really nice nice thing that people were going actually we we kind of care about what this place visually looks like mm. um and the sign writing squad was like the first of the projects for elsewhere to really kind of make a in, in one hand a visual impact but also then it was kind of a little bit like what is a collective action that we can do safely together to kind of impact on that space and so through what we were there we were there for four or five days cleaning the fronts of buildings repainting them and then repainting the signboards and chatting with everybody coming up and down the street whilst we were doing that um was really was really interesting to hear how people were reflecting on how the town had felt for them after a few months of being away and, and what kind of things felt really valuable to everybody now that they were returning. Um, and that 
taking care and like taking that little bit of like what does it mean for a community to own a building and then actively want to you know uh, impact on how the town looks and how that then impacts everybody else who's just walking through or just stopping for a coffee was was like a sort of a trickle effect of what those little small actions happen or have an effect on and that that felt like a really important start for the elsewhere project in a lot of ways is that we kind of we began these conversations by that small little action of just painting some bits of wall and cleaning up the grubbiness, you know? I mean, what, uh, yeah, well, what, you, listening to you there, the, just that word ownership is 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 coming to me really, really strongly because, I mean, you and I have been at this stuff a long time and remember those some of those early stove actions where where people were, were almost sort of like outraged about like who 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 on earth gave you permission to 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 do that you can't do that in the town and we were like well it's it's a public space you can do you can do what you like and and there really was that culture i think in 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 the town center of well the town sort of belongs to somebody else and we're quite not quite sure who that somebody else was this sort of the, the shops Maybe I mean maybe you know that idea of the outside mall that it's a sort of almost a private space that's owned by the shops or 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 the council or I don't know, but you know what you're describing there is is a really interesting process. It sounds like of, of taking back a degree of ownership and responsibility entirely, um, and that was really only I guess that was only really possible because of the fact that that we as the Elsewhere Project were able to interact with the stove and with Medstepo Quarter and those buildings, us being able to say these buildings are owned by the community. And that that was then the permission that people needed to say, well, yes, that's that's exactly what should be happening with those buildings. And if they're owned by by folk here, then then we should also be helping tidy them up. And, you know, and that kind of gave people permission to feel like that was a totally acceptable option. And why weren't all the other buildings secretly being, you know, equally being treated the same? So, yeah, we should probably. You know, Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of you, am I? No, 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 not at all. I just um, I'm conscious that people might not know what Mid Steeple Quarter is, and you know that the it's a it's a um, it's a community led initiative in Dumfries to um, uh, to actually try and buy back the high street from absentee landlords and redevelop them as a community. So they the Mid Steeple Quarter own five five buildings at the moment, and two so the the sign writing squad they they it was the two two buildings that Midstable Quarter just purchased right is that that yeah that so we we were originally we approached um the Midstable Quarter's uh project manager to see if we could find some spaces where we could um share some of the work that was being created as part of the elsewhere commissions um and they had just recently acquired these two <laughs> shop fronts that had huge big um beautiful glazed sections that were going, those would be absolutely perfect. Um, and so we thought well, the best way to kind of introduce these spaces as part of the project was going to be to also give the, the shop fronts a bit of an identity. So we worked with um, Louise and Kirsten at the, as part of the Dumfries sign writing squad to um, design and repaint that identity for the project, which um, then kind of allowed us to almost brand that space as part of our project and kind of give give the project like a locating point in the town center. And as as we built up the whole concept for the Elsewhere Weekend and all the various projects that then became part of that, we all sort of focused them around about that space so that it allowed people to kind of make a journey around the town center from from the stove around about those mid steeple quarter buildings and background again, kind of allowed people to travel a wee bit. This, this is where podcasting has its limitations we need pictures here when because of the, the, there are two there are two i've got a very clear picture in my head of two two um shop fronts next to each other with a, with sign boards that sort of almost run together and and they they say here there elsewhere is that right so here there was on one and then elsewhere was on the other so okay so can you can you um yeah i mean we've, we've, we've set the scene for the work of other artists can you can you maybe talk us through some of the some of the projects that happened sure so initially um when i began to kick off this idea of elsewhere i approached uh, three of the artists who had been working as part of homegrown to um to split out the commission um 
throughout this pandemic into various commission, like smaller commissions for the individual artists. So um, we worked with um, Owen McCall, Helen Walsh and Andy Brook, um, who are three different artists um, who had all kind of interacted with the project right the way through. So Helen is an artist who um, is based in Powerfoot. She moved there from Cumbria a couple of years ago and we hadn't worked with her as part of the stove before and kind of she first I was first introduced to her through the homegrown project. She works predominantly in textiles and embroidery, but also in quite a lot of drawing and created a really lovely work about um, kind of hope and aspirations after COVID based on feathers and birds that she shared with us as part of homegrown. And then I had approached Helen about developing that work a wee bit further. Um, so she created a, a window installation called Messages, which ran for a month in about September last year um, and was really beautiful work and was really lovely to share as part of the project. One of the things that we did um, hope to open up as part of that project was to invite people to respond. And I think that's been one of the really interesting things that we learned as part of Elsewhere is that pre-COVID um, hosting art activities where you kind of invite people very lightly to respond to things by taking something away, filling it out, bringing it back, doing it whilst you're sat in a cafe was all very normal and easy doing activity. And actually during, during the past year that we found that, that sort of interactions haven't been very successful. And I'm, I think there's quite a lot, of, a lot of reasons that people's, you know, maybe attitudes towards that have changed. Um, we put out a wee a box of things people could take away information and loads of things got collected so lots of people took information home and nobody's, nobody sent us one back. And then I think it's maybe just a bit of an indication about how, how our relationship with our audiences had changed over, over that time and how people were thinking about, I guess, how they were sort of feeding back to those things. So that was, um, I guess, an interesting learning that we had as part of that project. Um, and also kind of allowed us to start thinking about how we use those spaces. So Helen came first and after Helen we um Andy who is a stove member who had recently moved to Dumfries um and had engaged with us actually for the whole of homegrown from Essex where they were he and his family were from before who can kind of stuck in a bizarre uh lockdown house move project so um they engaged with a lot of our our creative challenges and activities through homegrown and he made a series of ceramic sculptures and prints based on his kind of um, experiences of how people interacted with each other in public um, and in that kind of public space through the very early stages of COVID where everyone was kind of moving very cautiously around about each other um, and, and that remarking of space um, was something that he, he was really interested in responding to. So it was kind of nice to set up this shop space as as a kind of a, a space for artists to share their experiences, share their kind of ideas, aspirations, um, and became a really useful kind of passive interaction for us. And I kept using that phrase last year was a sort of passive interaction rather than, you know, people weren't, because we weren't physically in the space and we weren't inviting people into a building, it was a kind of different relationship from one we might have had before, but, but we did kind of experience a lot of people pausing to look for them or actually experiencing things unexpectedly whilst they were out and a lot of at the end of the project we had quite a long conversation with our artists and one of the things that people really talked about was that kind of that unexpected stumbling upon and how really important not important but how special that became for for them and for kind of their wider communities was as we were going about feeling like we hadn't hadn't been able to engage in a lot of either our creative community more generally or that kind of activity that all you know fires everyone up when we when you go and visit things um, but the things that you kind of come across very accidentally in your kind of daily walks daily work um, those all became really important moments in that year for a lot of people and just kind of giving people a little bit of a I guess almost like a bit of a, a buzz or an incentive to keep to keep going and to keep knowing there's still people out there there's still things happening they're a little bit under under the radar at the moment, but we haven't all left, you know, and it was that notion that actually nothing, it wasn't that everything had stopped or everything had had ended, but that everything was just sort of, it was just a little bit more subtle than it maybe could have been, had been in other points um, in our kind of relation. So that was a kind of an interesting way for us to start 
thinking about how work could communicate with that kind of town centre space, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then I guess Owen then took another another angle on all of that. What what what? Entirely. So um, Owen is based in Ayrshire, um, and he lost his job at the very beginning of the pandemic, which had had such a big a big change for him, obviously, as as it would do for anybody. Um, and, and worked with us quite a lot and reflected quite a lot with us on that homegrown project. And I really, it was really insightful. And um, when I proposed to him that he could get involved in the Elsewhere project, um, he came down to Dumfries to, to look at how he could kind of impact on some of the public spaces and, and look at some, I guess, particularly we were interested in those kind of like transitory spaces or spaces that you move through as you're coming in and out of the town centre. So we focused with, with Owen on some of the closes around about the stove and around about the mid steeple quarter as these kind of interesting move through spaces and how he could introduce some of his work there in the form of some really large scale murals and paste ups. Um, so that was, it was really, yeah, really exciting to be able to work on those with Owen and also to kind of be able to, for him, Dumfries wasn't his local and he was the only artist I guess who wasn't working with his direct local but was really I think responding quite in a site-specific kind of considered manner to Dumfries as a town centre which I really really felt quite important in the work um, and then so his were installed for our Elsewhere weekend in November and they ran through till January or the end of the end of December anyways. Mm. Okay and you mentioned the 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 weekend there let's 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 round out the whole thing tell us tell us about it because that was amazing it was it was it was special actually it was it was it, it's kind of hard when you're in the middle of something to see it but um so what we what we really realized that we wanted to be able to bring together was um i guess a kind of focal point to an opportunity to allow people to see a bit of all of the work that was being created as part of elsewhere and also that a lot of the other artists that we'd worked with through homegrown, um, we're still kind of cultivating small ideas, or had we'd 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 had shared with us some really incredible work digitally, and we'd been able to share that with our digital audiences. But actually, for me, what felt really absent was that that didn't exist anywhere physical. Um, and I guess as a as an artist with a particular interest in how we relate to place, for me, it really disconnected that all these work works had been really created with an idea of localism or their own local environment as part of the work that was really central to the way everybody's work pretty much that was submitted um came into our homegrown and elsewhere projects that it felt a bit remiss of us to just go well they're on the internet now and that's that's enough it kind of just didn't it didn't really feel enough so we um asked simon lidwell um jenna mccrory um, Joanne Mackay, along with her two sons, John and Luke Mackay, um, to all, if we could actually work with them to kind of adapt some of their homegrown works to be brought into the town centre. So our Elsewhere Weekend was comprised of 10 light-based and film installation artworks um, that people could take a, take a wee journey around about the town centre with. Um, and we did it in November, the weather was absolutely horrendous one day. It was a freezing time of year and we just kind of hit, we were very lucky in Zinfries that we hit that kind of lucky spot where we were able to do small scale gatherings. Um, people were allowed indoors to watch films in very small numbers. We could have the cafe open so people didn't all get hypothermia. Um, and and it, just, it just felt that, that little moment of us being able to try something out. Um, what was a kind of, a, in, in all of the context of last year, quite an extraordinary moment for us all to be able to stand in the street together. And I yeah. guess I what was probably most important about that is that when I mentioned the way that people, the town centre has really become a daytime space. I mean, it has been in Dumfries for years and years, um, but with the pubs not being able to open properly and there not being the same evening culture, that there's absolutely nobody in that town space after kind of five o'clock. So for us to put on an evening event that was only available after dark for the light, um, 
made that town centre space feel populated in by a completely different community. And that community really was about the artists who were putting their work out there and also a kind of an arts community who wanted to come in and experience it or who were artists themselves and kind of wanted to be supportive or connect in with that, that creative conversation. So it was in some ways a very inward focused, um, you know, it, we didn't reach a huge public audience, but we did, the audience that did come, of which I think was about 75 over the weekend, felt, felt really important because it allowed us to grow all those creative conversations and allow us to feel like we were, we were speaking to each other and sharing this experience of art making in public during this kind of crazy moment in the world. And the town, town becoming a, 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 a space for that to happen and as we're talking about that idea of, of it being public space and owned and but there was also I remember really strongly at that time that, that sort of sense that people were just gagging to, to, to sort of go to something again and and uh, you know and as you say it, it was a small community it is a small community here and uh, but, you know that was it was quite a considerable turnout given the weather and everything else in the time of year and um uh and, and I it, and I was a bit amazed by um, uh, how little else was going on because, you know, with a little bit of ingenuity, it was it really wasn't that difficult to put something on at that time within the guidelines of the COVID thing. And yet, yet so much was just like blanket shut down. You know, I mean, I, I don't I don't know whether was that was that how you experienced it as well? It was like, well, why, why aren't more people doing this stuff? It's not that it's not that difficult. And that was a real that was a real weird thing for me as a freelancer last year is that like everybody my calendar was emptied out in in about two days in March last year um, and the things that came back people were genuinely very shocked at so I, I had a couple of of public type activities which actually when you went to them felt incredibly safe and um, were, were managed very sensibly, even ones that were able to have really quite large turnouts were, were really possible. And, and then and that was kind of balanced with other people that I'd been working with who, who didn't do anything for the whole year that wasn't digital. And that really surprised me that, that people weren't, yeah. weren't willing or felt able to, to take that, that step into this kind of small scale, you know, like physical presentation of anything. And that, that, was a bit of a, a challenge for me. But I mean, I understand there's lots of reasons why you might have decided not not to put work on last year, but there were lots of ways you, that it was possible to put work on last year safely. And I was surprised that more people didn't actually. Yeah, it was like everybody just got a bit get a bit afraid, didn't it? Or we sort of got suddenly sort of like took on this thing, everything has to be digital. And then, then there was never a moment to sort of like, oh, actually, no, it doesn't have to be all all digital. And maybe, maybe that's going to be one of the things, you know, I mean, the creative community often often sort of like is daft enough to take a lead on things. I mean, maybe that's another thing that we're going to have to take take the lead on here is is like bringing back that public public space. I mean, I, I want to just, you know, before we move on from that weekend, just sort of paint a bit of a picture because, I mean, I, I the strongest, I just have such strong images of, of, of like, this is one of the spaces that you were using was, was uh, lined with glazed white bricks. It had been a printing shed and, and it was showing a film by Joanne Mackay, and Luke and John, um, that was based on a poem about Joanne's childhood of growing up um, in a family of slaughter slaughtermen. And, and just the, the evocative nature of that space. I mean, that just is not something that you, that you, you, you I've seen that film before online and it didn't have anything like the power of it being in space. And the same with Simon Lidwell's projection uh, of his labyrinth and then him standing outside drawing labyrinths with a long stick with bits of chalk on it. And you, you just can't do that digitally. And that's, that for me has always been the heart of why I make work. And, and the, the, the reason why for me, there's not really anything else I could be doing is because actually those, those 
things have the real potential to be magic. Like, on, and those spaces, I mean, in lots of ways, I haven't probably haven't sung and danced enough about how incredible those spaces were. So um, for Elsewhere, we worked with some incredibly beautiful closes and bennels, which have been there literally on the high street of Dumfries. People haven't been down them in more than 10, 15, 20 years in some cases. People don't know that they're there. I mean, there's a gate, but you wouldn't look over the gate. Um, and that whole, and then the spaces that you're referring to that Joanne's work was in are, are these incredible old sheds that are just, just behind the main buildings on the high street. And again, no one's aware of these spaces that are, they, they make up the structure of the town that we're all, that we are all part of, but that all of that stuff is invisible. And without the access to those spaces, then the opportunity to make those work in, in the way that, that they were is just is, is like totally impossible. So when, I guess one of the things that we really hung on to is that actually we really need as creative people, the opportunity to be able to kind of access interesting spaces. And in order to really have really full conversations about town centers and about public spaces, we, we really need to be able to look at all kinds of spaces within those. And it's not just limited to um, you know, the kind of the ones, the familiar spaces that everybody is already aware of, or just that doesn't really, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. Oh, there's a visualization thing there as well, I think, listening to you there, that, that um, as you say, those are, those, are, those are forgotten spaces, but you kind of need, need some of that magic to, to, to sort of show people the possibility again, because I mean, yeah, people can walk down an evocative old, old space, but, and, and you kind of go, Oh, isn't it a shame? This must have been amazing, and or, or, or imagine what this was like in the olden days. But but that that projecting into possible futures is is what some of that artist work can do. Not not necessarily going this is what this could be, but just that sense of feeling comfortable somewhere and having an experience that you might normally have in your living room or in some or in a gallery or whatever and being in a kind of in an unexpected space like that there's a power to that isn't there yeah there really was and that the collaborate close that had Simon Lidwell's work was a, a circular labyrinth projected down directly onto the pavement in really quite a, a narrow incredibly tall space um, and also in that close, there was some sound and projection work from Jenna and the two works and the kind of just that whole impact of what it means to kind of walk into a space and, and experience that work within, within all the other things that, that come with, with being in a place was just made, made the whole thing quite, yeah, quite important that that, that that was able to be done, you know, and also then I guess hopefully brought people um, who'd experienced the work digitally just into that totally next level of what that what that work was capable of being. Um, and so because with Simon, we talked about that from the very beginning when he first sent sent the film through, he said, this is what I what I really want to do with it is, is project it and to do this thing in space, but but let's have this conversation that we can have for now. So it's kind of always like, what can we do now? And then how, what can we be ambitious for doing next? And and then how, how do we get there? Because you know, every time we do a little bit, we're kind of like taking steps towards those next bits. Fantastic. I mean, you mentioned that that there was a, a big um, sort of gathering chat coming together of the, of the artists at the end. I mean, were there any kind of conclusions about the role of art and culture in the future of space or, you know, any light bulb moments there? Yeah, I think that was... In, in, in a normal circumstance, that was a sort of concluding event we would have at the end of something like that, where we would we would all get together with some food and, and some drinks and sit down and be able to do that in a, you know, in a really kind of physical way. And just the way that, that we were with regulations, we did it digitally. And actually, I was really surprised and, and encouraged by just how reflective everyone had been on their on their experiences. Um, of kind of being part of elsewhere um, and what that had drawn out of them. And we had some, yeah, some re actually the conversations felt that was probably to me the highlight in some ways of the whole elsewhere project was like the conversations that we were then able to have as a group about our ambitions for, for that public space. And also some of our kind of questions is like, of, of, you know, like uh, how, how we determine what's meant by the word essential or 
um, one after after these spaces have been developed, like where's the space for for the questions to keep coming, or where do we keep making, where where are these spaces for us to keep experimenting once once one building's been done up or repaired or made into the next fantastic thing or whatever, um, and the map that I've produced for um, the Atlas Pandemic Project, which is coming out in some point in the future really hoped to kind of, I guess, share a lot of the conversational elements and the really important themes or the bits that we really thought were most important as a group out of those conversations, if that makes sense. Can you just, you, you mentioned that concept of essential there, could you just say a little bit more about what you, what you were meaning there? Yeah, I guess in some ways we've maybe been talking around this quite a bit in the past 20 minutes, half an hour, and because, because everything that wasn't essential was stopped, and we kind of, I guess, a lot of last year was talking about really what what do we what do we term by essential, um, and of course, lots of things, health, food, safety, they they are essential essential aspects of of everybody's life. But there are also other things that are quite essential in in how we all, I guess, grow, develop, and communicate as human beings, and um, and a lot of those other bits of essentialness. Um, were things that people really felt had had often been kind of stopped or those were the things that were really slow to get started again like when we were asking why other people didn't start things a little bit sooner last year those were the things that a lot of people really felt the absence of mm. or the that absence of of community for some people was such a big gaping hole if they didn't feel that they could connect with the digital stuff mm. um, so for a lot of people when we were we were discussing this during the conversation about there was actually quite a lot of essential um, that, that kind of came out of, of this, just also, you know, partially through their, their processes of, of being able to, to create, but also that part of kind of connecting back in again with a community that allowed them to, I guess, share, share where they were at and where they were kind of aspiring to going. That, that those, those, there were lots of bits of essentialness that kind of threaded through the project in some ways. I'm not being succinct at all. Is one of one of those um, is one of those essential bits the need to ask questions then? So you were, that was that was the other sort of theme that seemed to be coming through of like this the importance of these kind of like in between type spaces that are, that are not not fully resolved to be the spaces where questioning and experimentation can happen and that that yeah yeah we were really interested in peripheral type spaces and in transient spaces and, and really thinking about spaces that don't have a fixed identity or purpose and, and how those spaces could be deployed, I guess, actually as kind of questioning spaces or as spaces where conversations that don't have a certain outcome might live um, through, so, so through some of these kind of works, it wasn't necessarily about posing a, here's the answer to what public space should be, but a little bit more about really just opening out some of the themes or some of the big the big questions that were rolling around in the artists that we were working with kind of uh, mm. minds at the time and, and being able to share those in a, in a sort of a public space that didn't say this is the answer or this is the only way to you know they just kind of allowed it to be added to a wider conversation and to place itself like dead center in in a demanding uh, you know it was, it was a little bit more subtle or a little bit more transparent than that so i guess that's that's you know i mean i i know exactly what you're talking about there i mean in, intuitively as a as a public artist we, we we're drawn to those spaces that have got that sort of like slightly questionable um ownership and meaning so that mm -hmm. it, it, it creates a space to to ask those questions and it just it just occurs listening there that you know, maybe maybe that was maybe that was something that was actually happening to the town centre as a whole. For for, for you know, because folk folk who aren't artists maybe don't feel about the same way about those spaces. But suddenly, people were were looking at the town centre, the whole town centre, as that kind of space where it was somewhere that you, know, you were looking for somewhere to hang out, somewhere that wasn't wasn't being used or controlled and 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 everyone was sort of like functioning in that way a bit and, and, and maybe, maybe that's you know that's got some real clues for where we're going next with with those spaces because we're losing our shopping centers so yeah was, was that was that something that the artists were talking about i think so yeah i've got 
just just kind of like scanning through my map and that notion of challenging traditional space use or really questioning uh, why spaces were were kind of decided to be the way that they were and how and actually what it would mean to change the way people um, understand or feel feel those spaces. We also talked quite a bit about about what what sort of infrastructure is really required to allow those spaces to feel a little bit more of an open access and like how, how do people feel um, safe in the way they access those and where are those kind of like what are the route ways into these spaces a lot of that kind of closes and bennels and how they're not very comfortable spaces they can make people feel you know especially when they're, they're badly lit and grubby they're just not spaces that people want to spend time in and that then impacts on how people are kind of moving around about the town if you're do busy dodging all the different kind of access routes um, and how we could actually really support what we started to refer to as like natural confluences of gathering or like there, there were spaces where people were without any kind of prior, you know, arrangement or, or designation, people were kind of claiming certain spaces as gathering spots. And, and it, we just kind of wanted to know actually, maybe there, maybe there are ways of supporting that kind of informal meeting um, and opening up some of those root ways that allows us to feel a little bit more like there, there are more options for the space uses of, of those, those areas in town centres. You know, just to, just to round up then, Katie, I mean, what, like, you know, we've talked a lot about future and the future of high streets, the role of artists and where, uh, in, in, and what's essential and why are artists essential to our future? I mean, where, where would you see, where would you like to take the project next? Yeah, I, I have been thinking about this a little while because in some ways it's been a little while since, since we kind of rounded this project up. And I've, I've purposefully spent quite a bit of time really thinking about how to draw the work together. I, I, and a lot of the time when, when you work on projects like this, we kind of put them in a box at the end and don't really take that time. And it's been what's felt really valuable about Atlas Pandemic has been actually that opportunity to be really reflective, both as a group, but then also individually um, about about what all this work was really for and why why it felt useful and important and really take that time with it. Um, and the things I think that really that really came out that were were really important was that for all for all the artists, that idea of of being local and being able to impact in their in their local space was was just like the heart of them making the work. Um, and and although in some ways you you know it might look like elsewhere it could be applied anywhere, it felt like the learnings from this project were really about working with people um, who have a connection with the town being able to keep impacting. And so I think there's lots of things that we did or trialed as part of elsewhere that we could trial again or that we could trial differently and that keeping looking for those opportunities to allow artists or to not allow, to support artists into, into some of these transient um, spaces in town is so important. And like, I just want to keep Holding the, holding the flag for people to get in there on that. Um, I think since, since November, even from like a, a COVID pandemic response, there's been a lot more learning about, and so much has changed. It just feels like we've done a pretty much a whole second loop since then. And, and you know, in, in, in the whole kind of like public response of that. So I think this, hopefully this, this year round, we're able to open a little bit a little bit more confidence, a little bit more security now that that people are feeling a bit safer and a bit better vaccinated and things, and that that has really changed changed how we might be able to offer these these sorts of um, gatherings kind of safely. Because for me, that physical presence and that being in space together was kind of the heart of the work in a lot of ways. Um, but I think also even like on a really basic level, I worked with a lot of people. With elsewhere that I'd never worked with before, um, we, we'd all we'd all grow in this this strange connection from a, a not particularly advanced plan digital project that just we, that was like an, it was an initial response and actually the way that that grew together was really really quite special and it's been really nice keeping in touch with all the artists over the past couple months, hearing how how their projects and works have been developing since or the things that they're getting into now. So 
in lots of ways, it's kind of actually we've, we've grown a little network and it's about making sure that we can keep keep something of those connections going. And, I, you know, we've, we've all learned how to do connections in a kind of different way. But it feels like we just we just grew a whole little a little collection somewhere in there. And that's that's been a really valuable thing. That's lovely. And I, and I think, you know, I mean, you mentioning the local there, I think we um, we really are making progress, and I think that the I think the the pandemic actually accelerated that with things like Karen's project with with the council and Joanne working with the the museum and of of like um, I think there really is a growing understanding around here of 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 the role of creative practice and its importance as a society if we if we've got things to think about or decisions to be made or directions to go in as a as a town as a place as a region that the artists should be involved in those conversations and i think what you've done with elsewhere has been an amazing um amazing example of that as part of the as part of the canon of that work now mm. thank you katie no um, thank you that's been it's been really special hasn't it i mean i feel immensely privileged to to be involved in any of it at all never mind to have like been able to sit through so much of it and learn so much from everybody so it's yeah it's been mm. been a really properly delightful thing to do this past year wonderful well thank you so much for the chat as well it's been a treat and you can find out more about katie and the elsewhere project um and in fact all the atlas pandemic are artists um and the rest of this podcast series at atlaspandemica.org and please do tune in again next week for our 10th podcast with public artist um t.s bell and uh Thanks again, Katie. See you later. Thank you.